So um, this uh, talk will serve in some sense as an introduction or as a context for the next talk that will be given by uh, Sebastian Bahamonde, who will uh, present some uh, recent results that we obtained uh, together also with uh, Christian Pfeiffer uh, from our research. And so this talk should really serve as, a, as an introduction of the, the context in which this research uh, takes place, which is the study of uh, scalarized uh, black holes. But uh, before listening to next talk, let's jump into this one. So, um, yeah, I may have prepared a little bit too much uh, stuff, so I might skip a few things here and there if I run too fast. But in any case, uh, what I should do is a little introduction. So we are going to discuss uh, during this talk and uh, the next one, modifications of uh, Einstein gravity at a classical level with a scalar field, as you, as you will see. And so uh, maybe the first question I should uh, quickly answer is uh, why should we do this modification of uh, general relativity? Well, it should be more or less clear, I think. Uh, but anyway, we know that uh, general relativity is a really successful theory. Uh, in a nutshell, it, uh, theoretically speaking, it's really interesting and beautiful, I can say. And also, more importantly, it has uh, passes with success uh, lots of experimental uh, tests, right? But it, despite those uh, big successes, we know that there are some phenomena that are hard to explain within general relativity or that uh, involve some mysterious pieces, I could say. Uh, and um, what I what I want to stress is that uh, we know that general relativity is not the end of the story, right? That at, uh, at some quantum level it should be replaced by some uh, quantum theory of gravity that we should still uh, discover. But um, some of the problems that, uh, that are uh, unsolved in modern physics, uh, like for example what are dark matter and dark energy, etc., are problems that do not purely reduce to quantum correction problem. Of course, you might expect that if you have a quantum theory of gravity, you might find answer to these problems, but they have in prints at the classical level. So it might make sense to uh, try to modify general relativity uh, already at a, at a classical level, maybe in a sense to, to help over finding this possible uh, quantum theory of gravity. So this, is, this might be seen as a motivation. Then the next question I should answer is uh, how should uh, we do this, uh, this modification? And of course, uh, this question is the tricky one, right? Because uh, there is no definitive answer to this point. And so um, there are numerous uh, attempts to, to do that. And uh, one of them, the one I want to present in, in this talk, uh, is to consider that uh, to explain those uh, phenomena, you will have to add some new degrees of freedom in your, uh, in your theory. Uh, in general relativity, as, as you know, uh, all the degrees of freedom are encoded within the metric and the with the associated level connection. And, uh, but formally, you could have other, other fields in your, in your equation. That's not, uh, that's not a big deal. So if you want to, to add new fields content in your, in your theory, the simplest candidate, uh, the simplest doesn't mean the better, right? But the simplest, at least for a first attempt, is definitely a scalar field, which is the um, simplest coherent object you, you can imagine, and which is already very present in, uh, in modern uh, theoretical physics. So if you follow me on that path and try to add a scalar field on top of, uh, of general relativity to see the kind of effects you can get, uh, maybe the last question I should answer for this uh, introduction of the introduction, if I can say, is uh, why would we uh, study what I'm going to present just right after, so on the gravity, why don't we just stick to uh, the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian plus a scalar field with possibly some potential? Well, if you are uh, interested in black hole physics, which is what we are going to do in this talk, well, one possible way to motivate this uh, is to look at the so-called uh, Noer theorems. So, you first of all, you may already have heard about a uh, Noer theorem in general relativity that tells you that uh, basically black holes are characterized only by their mass, uh, they uh, charge if they are charged, and their spin if they are uh, spinning. Uh, but here I'm discussing another uh, kind of results, which is um, a no-scalar hair theorem, so to say, 
So a result that uh, tells you that under some conditions, if you want to have a scalar field on top of your GR description, well, the, the system would be so that the scalar field must be trivial, so let's say constant, and then it will have uh, no back reaction on the metric, on the geometry of your space-time. And so this means that if you fall into the condition of such a result, then in fact you the, the black hole solution that you will find in this modified theory will be the same as the one that you find in GR. And so if you are interested in finding... Um, in finding new types of black hole solution, then uh, you may want to avoid such a, such a situation. Well, of course, um, this is a, this is a theorem, so it's something proven. You you cannot uh, you cannot really contradict it. But what you can do is have a look at the hypothesis, because as any theorem, it has some hypothesis, and those, then uh, this can point to some direction from how you can uh, avoid this kind of situation. And so, uh, very briefly. Um, in general, uh, no, no scalar hair theorem apply to asymptotically flat black hole space-time, and then they have several hypotheses. I don't want to go into all the details, but schematically, um, you will have some hypotheses on the symmetries of your space-time, on the symmetries of the scalar field, uh, which in general says that the scalar field has the same symmetry as your space-time. Then you will have to specify a bit what is your theory, so what are the coupling between your scalar field and your gravity sector. And in general, you will also need some extra condition to... Um, yeah, by the way, there is a good uh, review by uh, Herdeiro and Radu from uh, 2015 that goes into the details of all of this. Um, I, I have a list of uh, references that I will show you at the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, so... Yeah, to answer so my previous question, why not just looking at the, the simplest case of a theory with a minimally coupled scalar field? Well, there is a, an example of no scalar theorem that is due to Bekenstein, and that uh, tells you precisely that under those hypotheses I was uh, picturing before, you may only have a, a trivial scalar field. So this applies to uh, asymptotically flat and stationary space-time with a scalar field that has the same symmetries as your as your space-time, and uh, with a minimal coupling condition, so you, you have uh, your, your scalar field with its uh, usual term, and plus some, some condition on the, the potential that you, should, uh, that you should impose. I don't want to go too much into details of, of this last hypothesis, uh, but we need it to conclude. What is interesting uh, nevertheless, is that this theory is quite unrestricting, uh, this theorem, sorry, is kind of unrestricting uh, regarding what you put for your gravity sector, as the proof makes, uh, in general, no use of the Einstein's equation, it just uses the scalar field uh, equation. So, um, in, a, in a nutshell, um, so I don't want to present the proof, but uh, what I could call a skeleton of the proof, the idea is that... Um, you will construct some uh, some quantity that depends on your scalar field and integrate it of the black hole exterior region, and you would prove that this, uh, under the symmetry hypothesis you've done, that this should have a definite sign. Then, uh, so this would be for like any type of a scalar function that has uh, the, the right properties, and then you would prove that if this is not any scalar function but a scalar field that uh, solved the field equation, so uh, here the, the field equation for the scalar field that I depict by this E phi. And under this condition, then this integral should in fact vanish. And then uh, what you will use is, uh, you will have a closer look at the explicit form of this function uh, f that I didn't wrote explicitly here. But in general, what you would do is look at this and conclude that if this integral should be zero, which it should be if the scalar field solved the equation, then the scalar field profile must be constant. And so, if you are in such um, in such a regime, again, you cannot find new types of uh, of black hole solutions. And so, the rest uh, of the stuff I'm going to present in in this talk are, in a sense, uh, research that uh, avoid this uh, this nowhere uh, theorem. What this theorem can can be done is uh, can, can do. Sorry, is uh, to motivate. Uh, the introduction of new types of coupling between your scalar field and your gravity. And so this is where Ornesky gravity uh, come into the picture. So 
Um, if you want to have a theory with, uh, with your general relativity description plus a scalar field, uh, what would be nice is to have a classification, so to be able to answer the question, uh, can I find the most general theory, which has a variational principle uh, associated to it, that would uh, include a single real scalar field, a metric tensor with the associated Levi-Civita connection, and that gives you second-order uh, field equations. So, why second-order field equation? Again, this is a bit a uh, technical requirement, but the idea is that, um, in general, uh, when you have uh, theories which have a higher-order uh, field equation, uh, then they suffer some problems. Uh, it's not always the case, but it's the case for many occurrences. And um, then sticking to second-order field equation uh, might be safe, again, maybe for a first time. And so this question has been uh, addressed and solved in the early 70s by the mathematician uh, Gregory Walter Orndesky. And it has been, uh, in fact, rediscovered in the late uh, 2000 uh, within the context of the generalized Galileo theory, as it was called. And, uh, of course, both theories were proved to be equivalent. And what this theory uh, do for you is that they give you, well, the, what is the, the Lagrangian density uh, for this for this theory, and um, and here it is. Uh, this is the form of the of the Arnold-Scheele Lagrangian. So it's a kind of a big expression. Uh, we won't go into each and every detail of it, but I just want to stress a, a few things. Uh, first, you might see uh, that uh, despite the the field equation are second order. The Lagrangian here explicitly depend on at several uh, spots of the second uh, derivative of your scalar field. And so, um, in general, when you have something that depends on second derivatives, you will get a higher order field equation. But here you have the specific combinations that gives you precisely second order field equations. And uh, also, uh, let me point out that the fact that this expression is the most general that satisfy the previous requirements uh, comes in the fact that you have several arbitrary functions in this uh, in this expression. So you have this function k, g3, g4, and g5 here. And so for any choice of these uh, these functions, you will get uh, what you, what you want. That is a theory with second order field equation with your scalar field, your metric, etc. Um, so, yeah, again, very quickly, but I think it can be interesting. Uh, let me comment on the, the construction uh, of this. So how do you get to this kind of Lagrangian? And I will do this uh, in the most uh, recent context of the Galileo theory. So the idea was first to consider the study of your scalar field uh, on flat space-time. And this has been done in a paper by Nicolis and collaborators. And uh, the idea is, uh, well, first, as, as we said, um, you should uh, recognize that even though you want second-order field equation, you will have to deal with second-order derivative of your scalar field in your Lagrangian. And then you have to uh, find a way to avoid the higher-order uh, derivatives equation. These are the conditions you should impose to arrive to the expression we want. And then, of course, you have to carefully construct the most general expression that satisfy all these uh, conditions. And uh, that's why they did in this paper, and they arrived to the so-called uh, Galilean theory, or which can be generalized as the generalized Galilean theory. And this, uh, at this point, is still on flat uh, space-time. So if you let me clear a bit the slide, on flat space-time, you have the description of the generalized Galilean. And then if you want to introduce gravity into uh, the picture, well, you should allow your metric to be dynamical, and this has been uh, studied in uh, paper from Defiate and collaborators. And then, well, the idea is first to uh, allow your metric to be dynamical by just replacing your Minkowski metric by a generic uh, pseudo-Riemannian metric and the partial derivative by the covariant derivative uh, associated to the Levi-Civita connection. Uh, the problem is that if you do so too naively, um, you will get a higher order field equation on curved space-time. And the reason is that uh, on flat space-time, uh, so in the previous construction, you arrived to second order field equation due to some constellations in your, in your computation. And uh, these, con these constellations appear due to uh, the fact that partial derivatives do commute with each other, which is not the case for covariant derivatives in general. 
And so you should uh, you should pay attention that when you are on curved space time, you have some uh, counter terms to uh, to add into the formulation that would vanish on flat space time, but ensure that you have only second order field equation on curved space time. And if you do so, you arrive to what is called uh, the covariant generalized Galilean. We could call it this way. And um, and so this is the, the most uh, recent, I could say, touch uh, on this uh, on this topic. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Ornetsky has cracked the problem from a completely different starting point, well, from a mathematical starting point. So he directly asked the question, what is the most general Lagrangian density in four dimension uh, that has the property we want? Uh, and uh, the interesting stuff, as I already said, is that uh, the covariant generalized Galilean theory that I just depicted very quickly in the previous slide, it is equivalent to Ornesky result. This has been proven in a paper by Kobayashi and collaborator in 2011. And uh, so this slide is here, uh, not to completely repeat myself, but just to uh, emphasize the fact that this result is not necessarily trivial. Uh, once you study the Galilean or the generalized Galilean theory, you have the most general Lagrangian density with second-order field equation for your scalar field on flat space-time. But there is a, a priori no obvious reason why when you go to curved space-time with this expression, you should still have the most general expression, right? And so the, the fact that it has been proved to be equivalent to honesty gravity uh, for formulation from the 70s is really an important point. And if you do so, well, you arrive to the expression I displayed uh, before. And so um, let me just quickly here uh, in color uh, show you which are the terms that uh, necessitate some counter terms. So they, they are here in color. So the two terms in blue goes uh, together. And uh, so the, the counter term is the one that is underlined and the same for the, for the red here uh, terms. And so why I wanted to emphasize this it's just because you see that this is when studying this counter terms uh, stuff that you make appear the Ricci scalar, the Ricci scalar in your in your formulation, which is uh, well what you would expect to be somewhere in this Lagrangian because uh, you know that uh, the Einstein's equation that arise from the einstein hilbert Lagrangian uh, precisely are second order, so they should be somewhere in the picture, and so well here they are if you choose some specific uh, choice of the non-minimal coupling functions here. And also this points out to uh, maybe an expected uh, sector with, where you have a non-minimal coupling between the Einstein tensor already in the Lagrangian with uh, the derivatives of your, of your scalar field. And so, yeah, I see that time is running, so maybe I will skip the example, but just here I, I wanted to say that you can have the einstein uh, klein gordon lagrangian of course, and also, uh, yeah, maybe this is important. Um, you see that the expression depends on the scalar field, also on its derivatives, but it depends on the scalar field only via the arbitrary function, so k, g3, g4, and g5, again. And so if you choose this function carefully so that they do not depend on the scalar field, then the whole expression does only depend on uh, the derivatives of, this, of the scalar field. And so your theory uh, acquires an invariance uh, called as a shift symmetry, when your scalar field goes to this scalar field plus uh, a constant. And then, according to Noether theorem, you should have some conservation law associated to it, and this, basically, this conservation law is the equations of motion for the scalar field. So, now for the few minutes uh, left of, the, of this talk, I would like to briefly uh, review or comment on some, uh, some black hole solution that has been found within uh, Orndesky gravity. And first, uh, stuff that has been found with a non-minimal coupling to the ghost bonnet invariant. So, um, where you have your uh, your Einstein-Hilbert term, a kinetic term for your scalar field, plus some uh, term here of this form. So, where you have the ghost bonnet invariant times some uh, non-minimal coupling function that depends on uh, your scalar field. So, first of all, the fact that this can be... Um, found as a particular case of the ornesky lagrangian might not be completely obvious uh, from the from what I the expression I showed in the previous slides but uh, it, you, you can prove that by performing some integration by part and maybe some redefinition here and there you can obtain uh, this lagrangian as part of the ornesky description and uh, it is, uh, it is interesting indeed uh, because uh, if you study this in four dimension which is what we should uh, do here 
um, you know that the ghost bonnet Lagrangian is a total uh, divergency. So if you add this into the action without the non-minimal coupling, it will just give you a form that return and so no contribution to the field equation. And so this non-minimal coupling with the scalar field might be seen in a sense as a way to make the ghost bonnet uh, term uh, dynamical in your equation. Also, so uh, if you look into black hole physics and you want, uh, if you remember my motivations, and you want uh, to find solution where the scalar field is non-trivial, and so you have really new interesting, uh, possibly interesting patterns, well, this model is interesting because basically uh, the, um, the curvature of your space-time uh, via the ghost bonnet Lagrangian, uh, here specifically, will act as a source for your uh, scalar field and will, uh, in almost uh, all the cases, will then give you a non-trivial scalar field because you will have uh, such an equation. And so this mechanism in general is known as curvature-induced uh, scalarization. Um, also, um, if you take a very specific form for your non-minimal coupling, which is linear in the scalar field, then uh, your model possesses the shift symmetry I was describing, uh, I was describing before. And uh, also, yeah, in the in the following, uh, so we will focus specifically on uh, asymptotically flat and spherically symmetric uh, black hole uh, solution. So, um, one first thing that has been done uh, by Sotirio and uh, collaborators was to precisely study the case where you have a linear coupling between uh, your scalar field and your ghost bonnet term. And so, uh, in this case, um, well, I don't want to bother you with the technical details, but just uh, an important thing to, to point out is that if you want uh, your solution to be uh, regular at the event horizon of your black hole, so you don't want uh, anything to go to infinity at the, at the event horizon, well, if you want this, uh, you have to impose some condition on the derivative of your scalar function uh, at the event horizon, and you have to fix this quantity as the solution of a quadratic polynomial equation, and then this means that uh, since your scalar field is supposed to be real, you have to take care of the sign of the discriminant of this uh, polynomial equation. It should be positive. And uh, this is important because, in fact, it uh, fixes um, a constraint on the value of the non-minimal coupling parameter, so the constant uh, gamma 1 that is here. It should be smaller than some, uh, than some maximal value, otherwise this uh, delta quantity will become negative, which we do not want. And uh, what they were able to do in this, uh, in this paper is that they were able to found uh, numerically uh, scalarized uh, black holes for every possible value of this non-minimal coupling function, so from zero to this maximal value that you can compute. So for gamma 1 equals zero, you kill the, the non-minimal coupling, and so you just get the Schwarzschild uh, solution. And then you can continuously deform it to get uh, explicitly scalarized black hole solutions for different value of the parameter uh, gamma 1. So also, yeah, there are no excited solutions, so your scalar field never has a node. Uh, so yeah, this I will, I will skip, uh, just so that I have a few time to tell you about what happens if you look at another type of coupling, which is a quadratic uh, coupling between your, your scalar field then and the uh, ghost bonnet uh, Lagrangian. This has been done by uh, Silva, also Sotirio and other collaborators. And uh, I wanted to comment on this because in this case, the spectrum of solution is very, very different from the former case. Uh, again, if you want a regularity of the solution, you still have to fix the derivative of your scalar field as a solution of a quadratic uh, equation. So you still have to be sure that the discriminant, which has a slightly different expression here, but that it is positive. But you also should impose in this case that the scalar field at the, uh, the horizon is non-zero and the non-minimal coupling gamma 2 is non-zero. Basically, they appear in the denominator of, uh, of some expression. And... Um, in this case, then, you can only find a solution if the constant gamma 2 lies in a very narrow band. Um, so between a value gamma 2 critical, let's say, and gamma 2 maximum. And the reason for these two uh, limits is that uh, in one of the limits, the delta goes to zero and will change its sign, which you do not want. And in the other limit, the value of the scalar field at the horizon goes to, goes to zero, which you do not want. And so, um, also in this case, you can find excited solutions. 
and uh, then yeah maybe i will skip this slide with a few details due to time restriction but then what you have to imagine is the following picture is that uh, if you want to look at stuff as function of the gamma 2 parameter you can only find a solution in a really short band where both so the value of the scalar field as the horizon is non zero and the discriminant is positive so this means that in this case you have no smooth limit to connect to the case where gamma 2 would be equal to zero and where you would basically only uh, have no non-minimal coupling and the short shield black hole. So here uh, you have some spontaneous scalarization as it was called um, where, where you can only find solution for this gamma 2 in this really short band. Here I depicted uh, what would correspond to the unexcited solution. You can imagine that this pattern uh, repeats uh, in a discrete way for the excited solution. And so um, the fact that the solutions are so different uh, between the, um, the first case where you have the shift symmetry and the other case when you have the spontaneous scalarization, uh, this led uh, my collaborator, uh, Yves Brier and, uh, and myself, to wonder, well, what happens if you have both terms uh, at the same time? So if you have a linear and a quadratic uh, coupling at the same time, and so that's what we did in 2018. And it was uh, it was really uh, really interesting. So basically, uh, this expression, where you have a linear and a quadratic term, you might see this as the most general uh, quadratic expansion for a generic f of phi. Um, and in fact, what we were able to obtain is a pattern of solutions uh, that extrapolate between the shift symmetry and the spontaneously scalarized uh, black hole solution. So uh, this is the picture I shown you before. So which shows you as a function of gamma 2 where in this uh, plot you can, so in this axis of gamma 2 you can find solution. So this is when you have only the quadratic coupling, so the gamma 1 constant is 0 but the gamma 2 constant is non-zero. And so what happens is that if you turn on both uh, non-minimal coupling parameter, then you can get a pattern of solution that is much more uh, rich. So if you look uh, very quickly at the, at the blue curve, well, you should imagine that each point on this uh, on this curve will correspond to a specific uh, solution of the of the equation that can be characterized uh, by its, its mass and several other properties. Here, I just want to comment on when solution exists or, or not uh, to respect the time. And so, uh, what you see is that you have some solutions that are really close and really similar if you look at them in detail to the spontaneously scalarized solution found by Silva and Sotiru and collaborators. But then you can find a whole bunch of solution which has so this value of gamma 1 that is non zero and a value of gamma 2 that can get all the way to gamma 2 equals to zero and gamma 1 is not zero so which correspond to the um, shift symmetric black hole uh, solutions that we discussed at the beginning and so uh, so yeah you have pretty different patterns and a way to find a connection between the between the two so yeah, once again, time is running, so I just wanted to comment, but this will this will be very quick to another sector of Rondetsky gravity that was really interesting back in the days, uh, which is the one I already pointed out, where you have a non-minimal coupling with the Einstein uh, tensor. And so uh, here there is a paper from Babichev and Charmusis, where the authors were able to find uh, exact uh, spherically symmetric black hole solutions. So, in the previous slides, the, the other model I described were uh, studied via numerical investigations, right? And so here they were able to find uh, some, some explicit solutions. And they uh, did it in a, in a way that is uh, really interesting. They allowed their uh, scalar field to be linearly time-dependent. So they were looking, um, again, to spherically symmetric black hole solution, but the scalar field explicitly violates this condition. But in a way, if you look into the details, uh, that is such that the equations are still consistent for a spherically symmetric uh, metric. And uh, yeah, they also have to impose a condition on the, the current that comes from the shift symmetry of the scalar field, because in this model you also have the shift symmetry. But uh, I, yeah, I will not comment on this too much. And then they were able to find some, uh, some exact solution, like um, what they call the steel Schwarzschild solution. So basically, this is a solution where your space-time uh, is really the Schwarzschild uh, space-time, but at the same time, the scalar field is not uh, constant. It has really a non-trivial profile as a function of R and T. 
And so this is a really subtle way to uh, circumvent the kind of NOAA result I discussed at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, they were also able to find some uh, Schwarzschild acetyl solution, but I will, I do not want to uh, go too much over my time, so let me just go to the conclusion. I hope that I convinced you that uh, doing modification of uh, GR is a necessary task, even though it might be hard and that a classical modification of GR may provide a useful and uh, relevant playground. So we saw very, very quickly, this was just a glimpse, of course, but we saw that the study of black hole solution in scalar tensile gravity can reveal a really interesting and rich uh, pattern of, uh, of solutions. And so, um, as possible outlooks, well, this can serve as an inspiration, well, for the study of other types, of other types, excuse me, uh, of uh, theories with scalar field. For example, you may wonder what happens if you have non-minimal couplings uh, between your scalar field and your gravity sector in the context of teleparallel theories, which is what Sebastian will discuss in a few seconds. And um, you can look at other, at other kind of stuff. For example, in general, you are not uh, restricted to black hole study, of course, the study of any kind of compact object like boson stars or neutron stars. Uh, in this extended uh, scalar to gravity uh, couplings, as I should call them, uh, is also a very interesting uh, question. But uh, I think my time now is, uh, is over, so I will just thank you for your attention. Uh, stay tuned for next talk, and so uh, here are the, the references I promised at the beginning. Very good, Ludovic. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice talk. So is there any questions from the audience? Or you can chat it. Let me then uh, add a comment and a short question. Uh, I mean, initially the Gauss bonnet term was not considered by Hordensky himself. However, I mean, you can prove uh, th through mm -hmm. spatial integrations that it, it belongs to Hordensky type, right? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, maybe that was not uh, crystal clear the way I uh, the way I said it, but yeah, yeah, sure. And, um, so the, the study of the of the Gauss Bonnet term and the motivation of studying Gauss Bonnet uh, gravity, so with coupling maybe to a scalar field, uh, yeah, is not the necessarily the, the task of Rondesky. Just uh, if you look at this theory, you will find that it has a second order field equation, and so as long as Rondesky uh, gives you the most general expression that can allow for a second order field equation, you should expect to find this as a subclass of the Rondesky Lagrangian. Uh, also. Um, this, uh, this theory was interesting to study in the context of Rondesky gravity because um, I had no time to go into the details of this, but uh, there was a NOAA theorem uh, specifically for the case of Rondesky gravity uh, that tells you that if you have uh, shift symmetry uh, in your theory, you should have then uh, no non-trivial scalar field. And in fact, what Sotirio and his collaborator uh, did uh, was uh, proving explicitly that um, if you have a coupling with the Gauss bonnet term with this linear coupling, you can indeed find a scalarized solution. So this is maybe where it connects to the Ordesky uh, description, but you can think of the Gauss bonnet Lagrangian uh, independently of this, uh, in a sense, of course. Okay, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, this, this uh, enumerated models, uh, almost they are gust-free, we know, but there is a, a problem uh, and uh, it goes back to the unitary, uh, unitarity of the, of the models. Uh, they are not necessarily unitary and maybe uh, they have some conflict. How can overcome this problem? Uh, sorry, could you repeat because I didn't hear the end of the sentence, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, they have, they have, the, uh, they are not necessarily uh, unitary models, and so they have some conflicts with uh, quantum gravity, and so how we can uh, uh, cope with this problem? Okay, okay. Um, so the the short because answer because is because the unit uh, because they are un unit uh, being unitary models, they may be causes. Uh, loss of energy and uh, it makes some uh, problems with, uh, uh, for example, information paradox and so yeah, yeah. how we... Mm. So, so 
the short answer is that this is not necessarily uh, what I'm really an expert of, this question of unitarity, so I'm, I'm not sure I can provide a satisfactory answer by myself, to be honest. Uh, but what I could say maybe is that, um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, these theories are not um, supposed to necessarily give you uh, the correct way to go to quantum gravity pictures. Um, these... Um, these are theory that you that you look at the classical level, and you you may be interested in whether or uh, or not they provide an interesting pattern that may or may not fit the observational data at the classical level. And if in some range they they can fit this observational data, then you can uh, you can take this theory and look, of course, if you if you can or you can't yeah, I um, see. overcome this uh, this problem. But then they are. They are not constructed uh, by definition as viable candidates for quantum gravity necessarily. So maybe the fact that they are not uh, unitary is something that may just uh, um, forces this theory to stick to the classical level. This yeah, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think... Uh, ah, Seb Sebastian, you have a question? Yes. Oh. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you are you are mute yes ah can you hear me now yes yes okay yeah my question was related to this still solution that you were saying so this is an exact solution you said so this, is this the, the unique solution that people have found in these uh, theories i mean exact solution because uh, as far as i understood this solution is like only churchill you have that ch just churchill and the scalar field is like somehow frozen i mean you don't have any dynamics in the scalar field so uh, well um that I mean, so, or, or can you really find like a exact solution like that really appears in the metric so yeah so in uh, so for the details uh, you should really refer to this uh, to this paper uh, from from Babichev and so the, the idea is that um, yes so they, they are they were able to solve the field equation by uh, assuming that the scalar field was linearly time dependent right and by um, adding the condition that the, the current G mu that is associated to the shift symmetry of the scalar field has a finite norm as the, at the event horizon. And then if you go into the detail, yes, you can really, um, in the specific case, so maybe I was too quick on that, but in the specific mm -hmm. case where you have, uh, so no cosmological constant, basically, uh -huh. so lambda is zero, and also uh, you okay. have the, the constant eta here, which gives the usual kinetic term for the scalar field, uh, which yeah. is zero. So this is a really specific case where uh, the, the scalar field acquires its dynamics, so to say, only through non-minimal coupling with the Einstein tensor. But in this case, they were able to solve fully the field equation to get that the metric is a Schwarzschild metric and that the scalar field has some uh, profile that uh, depend on, on R, so the function uh, capital F of R is here is not like a constant, it's something that really depends on R. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, but it makes sense. Okay, the, so the, the, the scalar field is not dynamic because it's not dynamical because you don't have a kinetic term, right? So you have this, mm -hmm. uh, this Jimmy new the, the Einstein tensor is in charge mm -hmm. that is just zero, right? That's why maybe they were able to find this solution because it, it's a very particular case when you have that the Einstein tensor is zero. So this coupling maybe is much simpler for the Churchill case. That's why they, they were able to find this exact solution. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, to, to be honest, I um, I don't remember each and mm -hmm. every detail of the of the way they provide the calculation. One thing that is really, really crucial is that you allow the scalar field to break the space-time symmetry, yeah. and then you, you get a contribution a constraint that comes from the TT component of the of the Einstein equation. Uh, the, no, the, the TR component, sorry. Mm -hmm. of the Einstein equation and then in this case yes if you assume that you are short chilled stuff gets more much simpler and you can find this specific mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay thank you thanks okay so i i think uh, we should stop here so yeah. thank you very much little big for this nice talk